Alrighty guys, what's going on? Linky here, and in today's video we are going to be discussing Pokemon Legends Arceus and what an open world Mount Coronet could end up looking like in these games. Now we already know that the whole entire overworld is going to be explorable by the player character, and we know that Mount Coronet is going to be and play a big part in this game. So how could the interior of Mount Coronet be in an open world setting, and what could Spear Pillar and all of its grandiose look like as well? Let's discuss that and let's jump straight into things. Now, when trying to determine what this open world Pokemon game is going to end up looking like, I think it's a really good idea to look at how Game Freak approached Pokemon Sword and Shield's wild areas, and especially the wild areas in their DLC expansions, being the Isle of Armor and the Crown Tundra. It's very obvious, based on what we've seen from Legends Arceus, that that was really, a, like, very much a test balloon for the things that they wanted to try and implement moving forward. The Wild Area was Game Freak's first try at a massively open world area in a Pokemon game. And for a lot of their elements, while it felt empty at times, there were some really good signs. And those signs didn't necessarily come in the base game, but those signs were really prominent in Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra, the two expansion areas that we got in the DLC expansion pass the year after Sword and Shield first released. Now, before we get into the rest of the video, I just want to mention that the vast majority of you guys who are watching these videos and hopefully, you know, enjoying, I hope, are not subscribed to the channel. Now, subscribing is free. You can unsubscribe at any time, and it would do a ton to show me that you guys are enjoying these videos and you want to see more in the future. Let's jump right back into the topic. They were so much more populated with people, with Pokemon, the idea of your starter Pokemon or any Pokemon in your party being able to follow you around in the overworld was added back, and that added another level of immersion. It was also really cool to see that there were some cave areas that were added in both of these locations that made traversal more interesting. In the Crown Tundra, you were able to explore openly a town. There was no transitional root hubs and you didn't have to go through a corridor in order to enter a town or a city. You could go right from the wild area with all the grasslands and where all the wild Pokemon were, and you could go right into the little town of Freezington. It was all seamless. There was one entrance that wasn't, and that was to enter into where you could go on the legendary Dynamax raid adventure things. That was a bit of a loading screen. But other than that, everything was fully seamless. That and the Reggie temples you had to have a transition into. But anything like a town or a cliffside, a mountain, going across a bay, any of these features were fully available to the player as long as you had the means and the resources to do it, and as long as you had the Pokemon to get away from wild Pokemon, which were decently strong in these expansion areas. Now, in the Crown Tundra specifically, we got a f really a first look at what an interior cave system could look like in an open world Pokemon game. You could freely enter these caverns and in some of them you could actually encounter legendary Pokemon. If memory serves correct, Terrakian was a Pokemon that you could find in one of the cave systems in the Crown Tundra, as well as some very powerful Pokemon. At one point I believe you could encounter a Garchomp in one of the caves, and as you explored deeper into the caves, the Pokemon got stronger. The caves also led to different areas that were unaccessible unless you went through that system. Additionally, inside the caves there were trainers you could talk to and get items. There were also hidden items scattered across the ground, and everyone's favorite feature from the expansion pass, the diglets that you had to find scattered about the Crown Tundra, or not the Crown Tundra, the Isle of Armor, excuse me, were also in those cave systems. So we can see from the DLC expansion that Game Freak is looking to make these more interactive and more expansive. Now, there were different corridors that you had to shuffle through. You couldn't climb up walls, you couldn't jump from ledge to ledge like in other open world games. You still had to follow a very linear path, but we could still see that there were some design elements being put into this whole thing. You can also extrapolate this. Take a look at some of the advancements that we've seen from the open world area in Sword and Shield compared to the open world area we saw in Legends Arceus. It looks more full of trees, more full of foliage. The Pokemon themselves look properly scaled and properly modeled in the overworld. And additionally, the battle system seems to be changed in certain ways to where it's a more seamless transition from you being out into the world into the battle itself. All of these things carry over into Legends Arceus, and you have to imagine that once they did these caves in Sword and Shield, they were really kind of a model and a mock-up for what they ultimately want to get out of Legends Arceus. Now, looking at the caves from Mount Coronet, 
A lot of it was restricted to the player until much later in the game through HMs. You couldn't surf up walls or rock climb up ledges. You couldn't jump and rock smash things to enter new areas until you got a hold of these HMs. There were some parts of Mount Coronet that you even needed defog to get through or else it would be a very difficult time. Mount Coronet in Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum was also home to legendary Pokemon, and not just up at Spear Pillar, but you could find Regice in a, ca in a cavern system in the northern part of Mount Coronet, and it was your only way to get up into Snow Point City and get up into the snowy reaches of the Sinnoh region. A lot of this would work really well with the systems and the schematics that were already laid out in the DLC versions of the Crown Tundra and the Isle of Armor from Sword and Shield. We can see that you can get through different pathways, we can see that they can put water systems, hidden items, wild Pokemon that get stronger, all of these things were already in the originals. And when you add in the gatekeeping feature of HMs, which I don't think will be in Legends Arceus, but it is safe to say that whether it's some kind of attribute that the player character has, there is going to be some sort of gatekeeping that keeps you from just running all the way to the very end of Legends Arceus. You're going to need to progress some to get more powerful. One of those things could be something that I've talked about in previous videos, and if you haven't seen the specific video, there will be a card in the corner right now for you to check it out. One of those things could be legendary bosses. As I mentioned before, Regice is already in Mount Coronet. Maybe Regice is guarding the northern part of the Sinnoh region. Maybe in order to get up there, you need to have strong enough Pokemon to take him down. That's some natural gatekeeping that doesn't require any sort of HM or other use that you do have to raise a good team of Pokemon to accomplish. Maybe in a, in a reality that I wish would happen, they would include some kind of feature such as totem Pokemon again. Think about this piece of, the, of, of, of gameplay from Pokemon Sun, Moon, Ultra Sun, and Ultra Moon. They made these boss Pokemon more powerful, and not only that, they gave these boss Pokemon allies. It made the battles more difficult, it made you have to think on your feet more and be strategic, and it made it so you couldn't just come in with a team of fully leveled Pokemon and just body your way through. You did have to employ some more strategy. This could be something they could do to create natural gatekeeping, and I think it would be really good for the interior portions of Mount Coronet to be guarded by features like this, as opposed to rock climb, rock smash, defog. These things that, it, it, it feels like it takes a spot, it takes a spot out of your moves for your Pokemon and your party, and it makes you manage your party in a certain way that could be restrictive, but it also just feels like unnecessary padding. There's better gameplay mechanic ways in order to make this all work. One of the things that could also be cool about Mount Coronet is you could see the interior of the mountain changing as you got further north. Since it's all going to be seamless, and since it's all going to be open world, maybe as you get more north in Mount Coronet, you begin to see some snow flowing in from the cavern entrances. The temperature maybe plays a factor in gameplay, and as it drops, you need to employ fire-type Pokemon to keep you warm. Maybe you need to have a sort of system that can conserves your energy as you're traveling through Mount Coronet. So, as you progress in the game, your trips can't be as long until you've gotten further, because you don't physically have the ability yet to travel through Mount Coronet to the depths that you need. The other thing that I think is interesting is the Spear Pillar factor. We don't know how big or how major Spear Pillar is going to be. Obviously, we know that the Hall of Origin is above Spear Pillar. We know that that's probably where you're going to have to encounter Arceus at some point in the game. But getting to Spear Pillar in the original games is more so a story thing. Eventually, Team Galactic finds the entrance to Spear Pillar, breaks through the wall, and heads up. And then you have a whole piece of Mount Coronet still available to you to explore for the first time. There could be some sort of feature in this where maybe a, a team is able to excavate this and you get up, or maybe these areas are only just being excavated for the first time, and we don't even know fully about the existence of Mount Coronet yet. There's a lot of lore possibilities here. There's a lot that we don't know about yet in these games. People could just be landing in the Sinnoh region for the first time. A lot of the things we've seen so far point to the fact that Sinnoh is a largely unexplored land. Maybe you are the first human to encounter Spear Pillar in millennia. Maybe you are the first person to document the path up to Mount Coronet and eventually seal it off for the future and set up the events of Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum. There's a lot of really good opportunities here and hopefully Game Freak takes advantage of them.
With that being said, I would love to hear what you guys think about Mount Coronet and what it could really be in an open world Pokemon game. Do you like some of my suggestions? Are there other things that you think they should include that I didn't mention here? Be sure to let me know down in the comments section below and leave a like on the video if you enjoyed. And as I mentioned earlier, be sure to hit that subscribe button. It does a ton to support me and it does a ton to show that you guys are enjoying these Legends Arceus videos and you want to see more. With that being said, I've been Linky and we'll see you all in the next video. Peace out.